Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. It's always give. Always good to give enough time for gratitude and thanksgiving to the Lord. The Bible exhorts us to make all of our petitions known unto Him and reminds us not to forgive thanks, to forget giving thanks. And uh, it's important. And uh, more than just around Thanksgiving time, it's every day. It should be incorporated into our prayer. And uh, I'm thankful for this song. Thank you, praise team. Thank you for ushering in the presence of the Lord. I feel it here this morning in such a great way. I uh, was especially blessed on this song of the blessing uh, from Numbers chapter 6. It was the only time in the entire Bible that God told Israel and the priest exactly what words to use to bless their people. And those three verses and at the end of Numbers chapter 6, God is mentioned, the Lord is mentioned three times in thee, thee, or you is mentioned six times to emphasize the fact that God's blessing is upon you. His attention is upon you. He intends to bless you and you and you and you and me. Amen. So there's no mistake about it that in that blessing, God's focus is on us. What a great God we serve. What a loving God we serve, brother. A great father. He's, uh, he's provided for all of our needs. Amen. I, I feel a special presence to the Lord here this morning. And uh, I, uh, I really appreciate the touch of the Lord upon us. I want to remind you that Jesus is coming soon. I, I don't think I can emphasize enough how close we are. And we preached about it for many years. I've been in this thing for almost 50 years. But I'm telling you, it's never been this close. It's very, very, very close. It's near even at the doors. And uh, the trumpet can sound any time. And we need to make sure that we're ready. <clears throat> it's not going to be business as usual. And so uh, we better make sure that... Uh, we have settled our account with the Lord. We better make sure that our sins are under the blood, that we have repented, that we've been baptized in the only name given among men whereby we must be saved, in the name of Jesus, and that we're filled to the brim and overflowing with the Spirit. And these services certainly afford us that opportunity. So let's not miss the opportunity while we have a chance still. Because Jesus said there's coming a time that it will be too late. Oh Lord, open to us. Sorry, the door's closed. Yes, praise God. <clears throat> I want to talk to you this morning for a little while from Psalm 142. And... Uh, I feel this heavily on my heart and, and the Lord touched me this morning as well. And I hope I can convey it to you in the way in which I feel it. Psalm 142, a psalm of David. It says, uh, my shield of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. It says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou used my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily or privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld and there was no man. They would know me, that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Notice that. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. 
Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountiful with me. On the last segment of verse 4, I would like to bring your attention to where David says, No man cared for my soul. No man cared for my soul. I want to title this message short this morning, The Cry of the Lonely Soul. The Cry of the Lonely Soul. I dare say there are some lonely souls in the midst this morning. And the world is full of many lonely souls who are crying out. And whose voices are not heard by anyone but by God. I want to talk to you about the cry of the lonely soul. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. And your touch upon our hearts, our lives, our minds. Lord, thank you for blessing us and giving us hope and showing us the way. And now, Lord, help us to contemplate, indeed, the lessons and instructions that you have given David through whose experiences we can learn and apply to our own lives in this last days. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. Amen. This psalm was written by King David at a time when he was on the run. The king, King Saul, was jealous of him. and David was, uh, was someone who has risen to a, a position of prominence, as you know. He, as a teenager, killed the giant Goliath of the Philistines. He was a great champion. Saul made him a great leader of his armies and... Saul led them out, brought them in. And uh, he was a great leader, a great champion. Everyone looked up to him. And then when they began to sing that Saul had killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands, the king, Saul, got very jealous. And that jealousy got to him because, you see, God departed from him. From a previous indiscretion and disobedience, Saul rebelled against God and God turned away from him and said, I'm not going to let you be king much longer and I'm going to give it to your friend, a fellow, someone's better than you, someone who is after my own heart and he will serve me and he will obey me. And in that period of time between the time that God turned away from Saul and the time that David indeed assumed the throne, Saul was very jealous and he persecuted David. And now David is on the run and he took refuge in the cave of Adullam, as they call it. He's been there several times. Several other Psalms are referenced to have been written there. But he's here at this point in the beginning, at least anyway, he's, he's by himself. And he's alone. And he, he, he titles this song, uh, a Mashiel of David, that is a psalm of instruction. And he, he wrote that specifically to let us know that there are some things that he learned in that cave. There's some things he learned in that time of his loneliness that is worthy to record and worthy for us to pay attention to and refer back to in our times of loneliness, in our time when we feel like hiding in a cave. And there are two parallel tracks running in the middle of this psalm. And one is really this terrible sense of helplessness and hopelessness on the, on the part of the psalmist David. As a human being, he's, he's, he's crushed, he's crying out. On the other hand, we, we see this strong determination to make his voice be heard. And more than anything, be heard by God. And we see that. Because, you see, it's a lonely world out there. And for David, it was especially lonely on this day and at this particular time in his life. 
I don't know if you've heard of Rudyard Kipling, one of my favorite authors in some respects. How many has ever heard of Rudyard Kipling? There we go. Have you, have you ever heard of The Jungle Book? Okay, there we go. Have you ever heard of Riki Tiki Tavi? Yeah, well, Rudyard Kipling. Have you ever heard the poem If, which used to be a very popular uh, uh, boy's graduation card? Uh, I got one when I, got, when I graduated from high school. I love that poem. That is so meaningful. Amen. It was, it was almost inspirational in a biblical context. Really, it is, it, is, it is tremendous. It's a tremendous movie. If you've never read it, look it up. But it was Rudyard Kipling that said that the human soul is a very lonely thing. We're born alone. We die alone. And in the depths of our souls, we live alone. Many of us are in, and really living in isolation. Henry David Thoreau wrote, and I remember that, hallelujah, the mass of men live, in, live a life of quiet desperation. Quiet, and they're despairing inside. They endure so much pain, and they go through so much, and yet they feel that nobody cares, and because of that, they don't share their pain with anyone. They don't share their burdens and their suffering. They feel like there's nobody to go to because... After all, who is it that cares about them? And so in Psalm 142, we see David in that situation. He feels re rejected. He feels dejected and discouraged and disappointed and cast down and overwhelmed, very much overwhelmed. He feels like no one cares about him. He said that. No man cared for my soul. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, he said, I looked on my right hand. You know, on the right hand is where a champion's aid would stand. And even in battle when David was king and he went fighting, there was a man on his right hand side. In Psalms 121, David tells it, he look, lifts up his eyes to the hills from whence cometh his strength, and, and there God anointed him to say that, that, Lord, you are my shade on my right hand. You are the one that is my protector. That when I'm attacking and I'm open to attack, that you're there to protect me, to make sure that I don't get hit, that I don't get wounded. But David, in this particular occasion, looks to his right. Looks for that one person that would be by his side. That one person that would stand with him. In fact, in a legal court case, your counselor would stand there. Your witness for the defense would stand there. And in this particular time, he had nobody. He's been on the run. He was accused falsely. And there was nobody to whom he could plead his cause. Very much alone. And he said, but there was no man. That would know me. No man that would acknowledge me. Would stand beside me. And consider me worthy. To be a friend. And then. That's when he cries out. When he was all alone. And nobody else. He cries out. And you know the problem is. Is that in, in our particular time too. In this day and age. We meet a lot of people like David. David. We meet people like David who also feel like nobody cares about them. And we see it in the eyes of the homeless. I know many of the people that Brother Alfonso has brought here as guests. Brought in who are hungry. And many were destitute, surely. Some drug addicts, some alcoholics. Some were just financially destitute. Some are mentally ill and some are infirmed and some are terminally ill. And all these different kinds of, not all homeless, I'm talking about all categories of people that, that are living this quiet desperation of hurt and pain and, 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 and a life who's, who, whose life consists of nothing more than doctor's appointments. It's this quiet life of desperation. You, you see it in their eyes that does anybody really care? Does my doctor really care or is he just you know, making money off of me? Those thoughts come to you. And we see it in the eyes of the elderly, especially widows and widowers and, and even single mothers, single parents. Living in solitude and, and not being able to share the burdens that they go through every day. The work and, and the children and, and the, the finances and trying to juggle everything on their own. They, they feel very much alone. And we even see it in the eyes of the fatherless children. 
who struggle through life because they don't have that extra helping hand along them, helping their mothers to do what's necessary to be there with counsel and give encouragement and guidance at the most crucial times of life. It's a lonely world out there, but is it true that no one really cares? Well, I think we can say the world doesn't really care. Many instances in times past, I read a story recently about the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. And it was uh, right after the Depression hit, you know, October 1929, when we had a big crash on the stock market for the next 10, 15 years. We're struggling as a nation to come out of that, that depression. Many people, millions lost their jobs. Soup kitchens were established. People were living from mouth to hand uh, week after week, year after year. It was a terrible time. People were in, 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 in poverty. And yet in 1933, they enacted this, this, this World's Fair in Chicago. And it was really meant to, to, to stimulate the imagination of people. It was really meant to stimulate spending. Really. Uh, to get people involved in the economy again. And, and uh, their motto was, I think it was, in industry finds, uh, no, science finds, industry develops, and uh, people conform. And uh, they had no plans for God in there. If you think about it even today, when you talk about the solutions that leaders uh, propose, uh, that solutions that government proposes, nowhere do they mention God in there. Nowhere do they mention the prescription for successful living from the greatest book that has ever been given to mankind, that is the Word of God. And certainly it was the same thing with the Chicago World's Fair. In fact, they had created a, a showcase city, a plan, and it was to be a showcase for modern living and consumerism and entertainment. But the thing is, is that this model city they created for show had absolutely not one church. It had no churches. And they said that the reason is because there will be no need for churches in the future. And here we are, almost 100 years later. We need churches. We need searches. We need somebody to care. But again, all of this was, was driven uh, by the need to stimulate spending during this time of great depression. See, the world is only interested in your money. I said the world. I'm talking about the world now. I said the world is only interested in your money. Interested in you. You're just, you're not just a number. We're social security number. We're a driver's license number. We're a credit card number. We're a debit number. We're a PayPal number. We're a cash pay number. We're just a number. Somebody that's got money and somebody that, that's got something that somebody else wants. Other than that, the world really doesn't care. And the Bible tells us, Jesus showing us that even some religious people don't care. The story of the Good Samaritan teaches that. And in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus talks to religious leaders who, who observed certain religious practices and ceremonies and, and rituals. And yes, they were religious. And yet, they really had no relationship with God. As a result, they really didn't care about the average person either. They were religious in one sense, but they were giving lip service to all that they said. They had, they had words, but no action. They said one thing, and they did something else. As the old saying says, you know, they, they preached water, but they drank wine. It was hypocritical living. It was, they were indifferent to the needs of humanity. But thanks be to God that we have a Savior who's different. Jesus cares. How many know what I'm talking about? Jesus cares about you and I. Jesus cares for you and me. The psalmist said that when he found help from no one else, he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Praise God. He said, I cried to the Lord with my voice. Now, David knew there's many different ways to cry to the Lord. You can cry silently in your mind. You can cry in your heart. And you can cry, amen, with your voice. 
You know, there's sometimes that, that you know, we, we can keep our prayers on the inside of us. Uh, but if you're hurting bad enough, uh, amen, you've got to lift up your voice with everything that's in you. You've got to open up your mouth. You've got to pour out your complaint. In fact, that's what David ended up doing. He, he began to pour it all out. I remember in this church, uh, hallelujah, there have been many times in my life where I felt alone, when I had my cave to, to cry out in. I remember sitting right there, amen, praying that, or on that chair where Andrea is sitting right now. I remember crying out to God. My heart was broken. I was weeping profusely. But I remember this. It was over 45 years ago. Praise God. I remember that time. It was my cave. There were other times I came and cried out to the Lord. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Praise the name of the Lord. But there's some times uh, that we've got to cry out to God. Understand this. Uh, we're talking about David, the man, the champion, who just defeated the, the Goliath, the, one of the greatest champions of the enemy. And I don't mean just a few days ago, but it was in his past. He's looked at as a great champion, as a great hero. And here's the great hero in a cave hiding by himself. He's praying and is crying out to God. Yeah. You know, it's all right. It's all right to be at the top of your game. But at this particular point, David didn't even have enough to knock Goliath over. He couldn't keep himself standing. And sometimes... Doesn't matter what your position is in God. Doesn't matter what, what position or title you hold or, or what you do or what successes you've already had. It, it doesn't matter what your revelation is in God or how much you know about God and what you experience. Amen. There, there may come times in your life where you're going to feel all alone. And nothing is going to help except you crying out to God and pouring your heart out to him. And you know, caves make good prayer closets. But David didn't just pray in the caves. He, he prayed in the palace too. And we know that. He was a man of God and a man of prayer. And we ought to, to, to remember to do the same. Whether we're in a cave or no matter where we are, we, you know, we may get knocked down, but it's okay. Hallelujah. And David said, I poured out my complaint before him. Notice he pours it all out, man. It's like water. It's not like a trickle. He just pours it all out. You know, when you're so full of emotion and you've been hurting and you've, you've kept it in and you don't know what to do and all of a sudden, you know, you break and you just, just, just tell God everything. It's like, just like, I don't know if you've ever watched, now if you're, I'm a grandparent, I'm, I'm, been, I'm a parent too. I remember my little kids and, and I remember, you know, when they get hurt, even now, Hallelujah. I babysit down there. My little three-year-old, when it comes, he, fought, he fell and he really hurt himself. And he comes around and says, ah, he cries, you know, and tells me all about it. <laughs> to mamas, especially mothers know especially what I'm talking about. And when, when your child comes and, and he's really hurting, he's going to pour it all out. He's going to tell you, you know, everything. And, and that's what David is, is intimating here to you and I. And that's what he did with God. That, that sometimes you've got to come to a place where you just don't hold it inside. But just you pour it out. Just tell God exactly how you feel. And it's not because he doesn't know about it. It's not like he's ignorant about how you feel or what you're going through. It's simply making you feel better. One of the greatest ways to find real Relief in your time of loneliness and hurt and pain and your suffering is to share it. Yes. Talk about it. Yes. Get it out. Right. Last Monday, I uh, went to Panera Bread Co. Amen. We, my wife and I love our coffee there. Love caramel lattes. <laughs> With an extra shot of caramel. Yes. Right. Gotta have the extra shot of caramel. And uh, went in there and ordered a, a latte and uh, went to the line and waited. Uh, we went inside instead of going through the line. You know, there's was too many cars going inside. I said, maybe it'd be faster going in. It wasn't that bad, but they were really busy. In the afternoon, about 4 o'clock. And then I wa watched the, the, the young lady behind the counter preparing, working hard. Her name was Brandy. She had a black patch on her eye. I said, interesting. My daughter, you see, oh, this was last Monday. My daughter, Julie, some of you know her, had 
surgery on her eye and had her eye taken out because of cancer a week to that day. And my daughter now has a patch just like that. I, so I looked at the girl. I just waited and waited. I watched her being busy. I asked her, hey, how long have you had that patch? And she was kind of taken back. And I've had it for about a year now. So, hmm. And she wouldn't share much, but then I showed her a picture of, her, of my daughter and her patch. And all of a sudden, I can't tell you what it was. We just connected. She saw pouring a heart out. Started talking about it. Started talking about her challenges and what she had to go through. And all that time, she's working hard. And after that, you know, even the manager caught on and he was there behind listening and so on. And he came along to help because she was getting behind. But he didn't, he didn't, he didn't interrupt, didn't say anything. But told me all about her difficulties with death perception, difficulty walking and different things that we talked about. And then there was another lady that came up who heard a conversation and she followed us right after we ordered our coffee and and she came up and she had dark glasses on. I didn't catch that. I thought it was just sunglasses. She said, I got eye problems too. And she started telling us about it. Here we are with other people listening. Yeah. <laughs> and the bottom line is, is, is when you open up and, and you, you acknowledge someone's suffering. And you have that compassion with them. It enables you actually to be, to be compassionate. There's a connection that takes place. And, and, and when, when, when this lady heard that my daughter had that surgery, she said, I, I'll keep your daughter in prayer. And the girl, Brandy, behind the counter, she said, yeah, keep me in your prayer too, she told me. <laughs> Amen. You know, it never would have happened if, if you wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have said something, asked something about, her eye, that somebody cared. Yeah. And I think this is also what, 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 what Paul was talking about in Philippians 3.10 when he says, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Now, you know, that's many times antithetical to Christian life and Christian walk. Oh, you know, we're not supposed to be suffering. We're, we're supposed to be healed always well and everything. Well, you know, there's a place for suffering. I'm sorry. The Bible tells me so. But sometimes God allows us to go through some stuff. In fact, I believe uh, if you read it closely enough, uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 tells us that... that uh, that we have, we have a heritage, and uh, we're heirs of suffering. Don't believe me. Verse seventeen of Romans eight, and if children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time or this present age and this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice, if we're joint heirs with Christ, then we will suffer. And if we suffer with him, we'll be also glorified together with him. Right. Suffering in one way or another is part of our Christian walk. And certainly it wasn't a time of Paul in the early church because they were suffering persecution. And we may have to go through the same thing. And unfortunately, too many people get offended because of the sufferings. But we have to understand that when we encounter people who are suffering, and we have suffered as well, and we show that compassion, there is a connection that takes place. It is an open door for us to share with them the love and caring of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Then it leads to a greater and, and, and better things. Right. And I think I might have shared with this story back in, in the 1950s uh, when communism, you know, I, I'm from Hungary and communism was there until 1990s. 
But Christianity was persecuted. And I remember uh, one of our Pentecostal pioneer brethren, Brother Alexander Horvat, telling us how that uh, when, when uh, the persecution was on and, and they were arresting Christians, I mean everybody, we say Christian, I mean everybody, Catholic priests, Pentecostals, Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, Methodists, you name it, Lutherans, they were putting them in jail. You had strict guidelines to go by, and so they wouldn't let you preach just anybody or about anything. And uh, so Brother Horvath, a Pentecostal preacher, he, he was arrested, he was beaten, and he was thrown into a jail hell, the jail cell. There was one other Catholic priest there who's been there for two weeks already, isolated, nobody else with him. Outside on the street before persecution came, you know, there were this animosity. You know, one church with another. Oh, you're, you're, you know, you're the Catholic. Or, well, you're a Pentecostal. You're, you're a cult member of this kind or whatever. All kinds of pejoratives used against other churches and so on. But when persecution came, when Brother Horvath was thrown in that jail cell, that Catholic priest looked at him, and he was so glad to see him. He just jumped on them. They both hugged each other. And they wept. They wept. So glad to see one of them. That somebody else is in there with them. Who at least believes in God. And believes in Jesus Christ. You see there's a connection. There's something that happens when, when you suffer together. And, 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 and you share those pains, when you begin to cry out to God and when you begin to, to show compassion on others, amen, and certainly again, Jesus is the one to whom you and I are exhorted and admonished to cry out to because he cares. David did the same thing. He said, I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend or listen unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. He wasn't in jail, but might as well have been in the cave. You know what I'm talking about. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. You can be in a prison house of your own making in your mind. Especially when you're struggling. And you feel like nobody cares. When you feel like you're alone, you feel like you're in a jail. And there's no way out. And you don't know how to get out. Lord, where do I go? Who do I turn to? Who can I talk to? And you feel that pain. And one of the most tragic things is not being able to share that pain with somebody else. It weighs on you. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally. That's what he's talking about. My spirit with him was, was, was overwhelmed. He's talking about his emotions. My spirit, small s. My human spirit, emotionally, I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do with it. I had nobody but you, Lord. And I poured my heart out to you. Let me, let me say this. Listen to me. Somebody, please don't make this, this act of pouring your heart out to God so spiritual that you think that that he doesn't care. He, he really won't. He really won't hear. Understand that he does hear. Yes. And he does care. Yes. Yes, he, does. he cared about Mary Magdalene. Seven devils came out of her. He cared about the woman at the well. He cared about the woman that was caught in adultery and forgave her. You talk about compassion. He cared about the thief on the cross. He cared about the widow of Nain, the only son she had in a coffin. Now who's going to take care of her? Jesus came and raised that boy right up from the dead. And he got up off that, that coffin and that, from that funeral, that funeral session and went back home and helped his mama. Nicodemus came by night. He cared about him. He was afraid, but you know what? He had compassion on him. Blind Bartimaeus by the road along Jericho. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he came. What would you like me to do? I want my sight. He said, okay. He healed him on the spot. You talk about compassion. 
He cares about you. I said he cares about you. Stand with me, if you will. The fact is, Jesus doesn't just care about you. He cares about the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He cares about you. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I just want to tell you that you need to know that Jesus cares. No matter what pain you bear in your body, no matter what isolation you feel in your soul. You know, church, we need to care more about each other. So we need to care more about each other. We see each other and uh, it's, it's one directional, usually pew, pulpit, pulpit, back that way. We need to be more facing each other. You can best do that, by the way, by sitting around a table at home. I pray that some of you would be more hospitable to each other and invite someone to your home for a meal and for fellowship. Beginning here and ask them, how are you doing? Be more compassionate. If you're hurting and, and, and you know, it, it, the, the hurting and suffering ought to be the more, most compassionate of all. You should be able to go to somebody and share with them your heart. I'm struggling. Now I know that you, you can't see that to everybody. Not everybody's your friend. Not everybody. You can't share everything with everyone. I understand. You shouldn't. But surely there's someone you can talk to in here. Someone who you know is your friend, a brother or sister. Somebody who you know will be compassionate and loving towards you. Certainly the Lord. But I know that there are many here this morning that are tired, lonely, discouraged, dejected, hurting. It feels like nobody cares. That's not true. First and foremost, Jesus cares. But we care. Especially when times get really tough, you know that we care. I think what we do here in the next few minutes is going to really matter. It's going to be really important. Because we compare... King David, while well, he wasn't king just yet, if we compare David here in this cave and to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's David and one who's greater than David, the Messiah, both finding themselves alone, rejected, dejected, in sorrow, very much alone, both of them praying, and the truth is, in the garden, as Jesus had a great breakthrough victory in preparation for Calvary, in the same way, David had a great breakthrough in this cave as a result of this prayer. Because it was after this prayer that 1 Samuel chapter 22 tells us that, that it was at, at, that, at this time that David went to the cave of Adullam. He's escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves together unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there with him, 400 men. He was no longer alone. Those 400 served as the core of his great national army to be when he became king. But it all began in a cave. It all began with a prayer meeting. It all began with him pouring out his heart to God. Yes, a great champion, a great victor, and yet finding himself in a great time of need, hurting and suffering on the inside. I wonder what would happen here this morning if we could get together and 
We could pray for each other and cry out to God for each other, with each other. I wonder if while we're playing here in this music, if I could invite you for men and men and women to women, if you just get together with some partners, get together with some people, please don't leave anybody out because you're going to have a breakthrough moment here right now. Not only in, in addressing your need of loneliness, of hurt, pain, physically, spiritually, emotionally. It could be that victory that would draw your loved ones who are in debt and discontent, those who are backslidden. It could be this moment that you have a breakthrough in prayer where you're pouring out your heart to God. Would you come? If you can come down here. There's, there's very little room between the pews, but if, if, if many of you could come to the front and gather with men with men, women with women, husband or wife is fine. If you're a relative.